Okay. Hi, folks. Welcome to Walking on the Ween Side on It Matters Radio. Today, we're talking a couple of my favorite things, murder, mystery, and Maine. Yep, that's right, folks. This broody New Englander found a book set in Maine that he just loved. And I have on with me today the author of that book, Eleanor Coombs, who wrote, and this book is called The Devil's Cold Dish. And it is one of a series of books that you have set up in that region of the world. Is that correct, Eleanor? Yes. It all takes place in, in a small area in Maine. Mm -hmm. Except for death in Salem, uh, he is a traveling weaver, so I sent him on a trip. He, he being the protagonist. Yes, Will Reese. Oh, yes. Okay, and a traveling weaver. Let's start with that. I love that. What is a traveling weaver? Well, of course, in, in those days, most people made their own clothes, mm -hmm. and women spent most of the winter spinning, spinning linen, spinning wool, uh, into, into yarn. Right. And in, weaving was actually one of the few jobs both men and women did, the women might weave at home if they were wealthy enough to have a loom, but the men would weave, and they'd take their loom on the road, and they'd weave for all the farm wives and the women who didn't have looms. Okay, so, now, you, you, you just said something, you know, you set this in a time period, but we haven't told our listeners what time period we're talking about, and it's one of my favorite time periods in history, it's the period just after the American Revolution. And actually, your protagonist, Will Reese, actually served in the Revolutionary War. Yes. And that brings up something very fascinating about him, which is he's at some odds with many of his neighbors because he holds a certain political figure in very high regard, that person being? George Washington. Yeah, now, of course, today we're brought up to believe, oh my God, Mount Rushmore, George Washington, father of our country. But folks up in that part of the world, up in Maine and, and New England, they had other people that they looked up to. For example, there was a, a fellow named John Adams, who was kind of held in high regard. That's and, right. Yeah. And, and uh, there were differences of opinion about politics. Yeah. And, and that's one of the many things that you kind of get at that most books set in that period really don't. I mean, you know, you, typically you read a book set in, in the post-Revolutionary War period and, oh, you know, George Washington is God. Mm -hmm. But there was a little more feeling about it. How did you happen to come upon that reality? How did you happen to come to understand that? Because so few authors do. Well, of course, you have to do a lot of research. And I think that the politics inform almost every year of, of everybody's life in a way, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the politics in our country, of course, are pretty divided and partisan. Well, I, when you look at history, I don't think it's ever been any different. No, I don't so know. I wanted to put that in the book uh, as kind of a touchstone and say, look, you know, politics have always been divisive. You, you know, yeah. And I, that, oh. There was one candidate from the state of Maine, actually, and I, I you know, and this is back many, many years ago. Not as far back as your book, but, but you know, we talk about how, how people is, attack. Well, in those days, his name was Blaine. And, and they used to call him James G. Blaine, the continental liar from the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Obviously, he didn't get elected. Uh, but <laughs> well, look at, look at John Jay. I mean, when you're taught about him in, in school, John Jay Treaty. Right. And it sounds like, oh, well, he had the treaty, it was perfect, everyone agreed to it. Well, nothing could be further for the tree, for the, the, the story. The, they were burning him in effigy. 
all along from New York down to Philadelphia, calling names. The newspapers are full of it from that time. Yep. A lot of, so, a lot of rancor. And a, a lot of it about things, a lot of it about business, of course, and, and, and ties to, to Britain. But one of the issues, oh my gosh, wait a minute, it sounds like I'm talking about 2017 here. One of the mm -hmm. big issues was religion. Of course, a little different issues. And there was a religion that had come into being, a very unique... Um, um, the United States, people here forget how many religions started in this country. Uh, for example, in Boston, we have Christian science. Out here in the West, where I live now, we have uh, the Mormon Church. Uh, we have uh, Seventh-day Adventists. Now, this particular religion that over which there was some quite some battling and arguing during the time of your novels it was called was what religion? That was it was called the Shakers. Uh, they they had actually had an official title, which uh, was the <laughs> Universal Church of the Millennia. But everyone called them the Shakers because they were the shaking Quakers. They were uh, an evangelical offshoot of the Quakers. Yeah. And they are the religion that is considered the first to have started in this country. Yeah. And the reason millennia is, is actually was a uh, uh, dispensationalist faith. They believed in that the end of the earth was coming and that they were helping it along, and part of this was through sexual abstention. And yeah. they had this particular form of worship where signed kind of like a dance kind of thing in which there was a lot of physical movement, which mm -hmm. gave part of the name. And actually, one of the Quaker communities was set in Maine. And you visited that, not not back then, obviously, but subsequently. So tell us a yeah. little about your experience visiting that. Well, I was, we were, my mother was ill, and of course she lives in Maine, as we discussed. We were driving from New York pretty much every weekend to check in on her. Mm -hmm. Well, when you drive up 95, there is an exit to, through Falmouth to Alfred, Maine, and that is where Sabbath Day Lake one of the Shaker communities, one of the earliest actually, mm -hmm. was located. Mm -hmm. So we stopped and um, discovered that it was one of the few and the only existent sh uh, Shaker community that still had living Shakers. Now when I started my research there were 11, now there are three. Yeah. And unlike many of the other Shaker communities which are living museums and they have interpreters who take you around, this one, you have a guide because there are people living there. Right. And the guide we had was the daughter of one of the orphans that had been raised by the Shakers. So she had all kinds of anecdotes from her mother. So, of course, we went through this, and I knew I had something. I went back to the little gift shop, and I bought every book, every book. And that was the beginning. Did you buy but, any of the wonderful furniture? With it, the, oh, we, you know, they, they talk about that, but they had, they did so many things. They were such a progressive yes. religion. In many they ways. They were a progressive culture. Yes. In many ways. Uh, now, as you kind of, as I kind of implied before, since they refrained from sexuality, they had two ways of finding new members. One was through conversion. And the other was through adoption of children in need. Um, yes. But now, not all of the people who became Quakers, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Shakers, uh, wanted to give up sexuality. And so that brings us back to Will. How was he involved? How was he connected with the Shaker community? Well, in, in the first book, A Simple Murder, he he's really has a bad relationship with his son, who's, who's young. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Will keeps leaving to, to travel and weave to secure their future, really. But emotionally, he's devastated at the death of his first wife. But his son 
looks at this as abandonment. So Will comes home one time and discovers that David has run away from Will's sister and her husband, and he's run away to a nearby Shaker community. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Will follows him. There's immediately an emur a murder, because this is a murder mystery. And uh, Will has an alibi, fortunately, because he's the first one accused as a stranger. And then he goes into the Shaker community to fight, start investigate. And he meets a woman who, several books later, becomes his wife. She is, I don't want to say excommunicated exactly, but if you broke the Shaker rules, you were pushed out of the community, even if you were allowed to stay nearby and perform tasks. She's a beekeeper, so that's what she does. Yeah, you you but, weren't shunned in quite the same way that you might be in some religions, but you were kind quite. of pushed out. Yeah. Yes. We'll be, we're going to be pushed out by time for a moment here, but we will be back. just talking about the Shakers and their role in this series of murder mysteries that my guest today, Eleanor Coons, has written. And those books, by the way, there are five of them, and 
The last one in the series, which is the one that I just finished reading, is called The Devil's Cold Dish. Uh, and we're going to be talking a little more about that. But the first one is a simple murder. The second is Death of a Dyer, and that's D-Y-E-R, somebody who dyed the, clo the cloth. Yeah. Cradle It Grave, Death in Salem, which is the only one that isn't set in Maine because Will goes out to Salem as an itinerant weaver. And finally, he comes back, as I said, in the book, The Devil's Cold Dish. And these are all available from Minotaur Press. By the, by the way, folks, a very fine house. So, okay, he meets this woman who is a beekeeper, and they marry. And one of the things I, I really liked about this book is it saw, told a lot about life in those days and the tasks Everything from the way people raise different kinds of uh, farm products, the grain to be ground at the mill and taking it to the mill, making honey, making candles, which is another thing that Will's wife seems to be very skilled at, uh, raising livestock. Uh, you know, it, it, it's full of... The, the reality of life. Uh, and clearly you've spent a lot of time not just researching in books, but visiting sites where you could actually see what this stuff looked like. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that that's one of my uh, first goals is to see. I mean, we visited Salem, even though... Um, it was, you know, obviously quite different than the time I write about. We visited several times because I think you need to see how the air smells. What's the topography? Salem has a model of one of the merchant ships, which to my modern eyes looked absolutely tiny, that they went and opened up the east for the fledgling United States. So I, I spent a lot of time actually trying to go places and learn some of these things, and I have practiced them. In Death of the Dyer, I, my day job is as a librarian, and we do a lot of programming. Well, my patrons went through dyeing with <laughs> onion skins and indigo and matter and everything I could think cool. of so I could see how it worked, how did it smell, what happened, what did it look like. And I try that with a lot of those things that I describe so that I know exactly what Lydia or Will Reese would have experienced. Right, and his wife's name is Lydia, yes. And Lydia yeah. is a very nice person, and people should really love her. But when murders start happening, there's suspicion about her uh, because she has come from this strange religious background. She is a, a shaker. And that, in their mind, quickly becomes equated with being a witch. Yes, a witch. So, you see, say, we always think of Salem witch trials. Everybody knows. But they weren't the only witch trials. They weren't the only accusations in this country. And, by the way, the Salem witch trials were when? I forget the 1692. 1692. 1692. So, we're talking a, over, about 100 years later. Yes. Okay. And she's a witch. <laughs> oh. You know, I show, this is something that has held on in American thinking for a long time. And by the way, if that sounds kind of strange to you and weird to you folks, just remember we still today have people saying, God sent that hurricane because of those people. Right. That's right. Actually, the first, the last witch trial in New York State was 1816, and Mother Ann Lee, who started the Shakers, was arrested in Albany for blasphemy in 1783. So a lot of those beliefs hold over for forever, it looks like. Yeah, forever. 
So one of the things that's kind of an underlying theme in The Devil's Cold Dish is tolerance and understanding of difference. Because, yes. and, and that's an interesting thing to set in rural Maine. Now, I, I did a lot of my growing up in Maine. Um, so, you know, and we're talking in the 1950s, late 40s and 50s, my being there, and tolerance was not exactly something you'd expect to find there. I, I remember, uh, just as one example, uh, we were talking to one of the local storekeepers and we were talking about hunting and hunting rules and regulations and seasons and he and he said you know he said well there's a season for deer there's a season for this, this, this. but some varmints there's no season it's open season all year long i said like for what what he said democrats <laughs> <laughs> well i'm not sure that has changed too much <laughs> No, it hasn't. We, we moved to Maine, and of course, uh, my mother's family came from Maine, but my husband, who went to work in a hospital, frequently got, as he's drawing their blood and so forth, these outsiders come to take our jobs away. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, most of them are not even qualified. Mm -hmm. So it, it was an interesting experience for both of us New Yorkers, you know. But... Um, don't forget that Will, as a traveler, has seen a lot more of the world, mm -hmm. a lot more of Maine, a lot, I mean, he was in the Continental Army, he, he's known a lot of people from a lot of places. Mm -hmm. So I think he's suspect, partly because his attitudes have changed, yeah. and he is different. He is different, but he also, <clears throat> sadly, and I, I you know, <laughs> although I share it with him, he feels like he's kind of outgrown Maine or at least yes. a small community. And I must admit, the last time I was back in Maine, much as I loved reminiscing and seeing it, I did feel like, wow, wait a minute, I want to get back to the big city. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I can understand Will's attitude. Now, what is very interesting about the Devil's Cold Edition. Of course, we don't want to throw too many spoilers in. We, we want you to read this and enjoy it and try and figure out who the mastermind behind the crimes. There are three murders and, and who's doing this and how they're doing it. Uh, so we're not going to tell you too much about that. But, um, you know, one of the things about this story is that there is the sense of being so quick and willing to accuse people who are different. So first, Lydia is a witch, then maybe Will is the perpetrator, and people are really quick to turn on him. Yes, and um, the reason that I put that in there is when I was uh, researching death in Salem, of course you cannot escape in Salem any of the, the, the memorials to the witch trials. And it's very interesting, They're, they do plays, there's a mock-up of the jail and all of that, but what I started thinking about is what happens if you're one of the survivors? You've grown up in this little town, and now you've seen people you have known since you were born, turn on you. People, who, your own friends, your family. That's what I was writing about, really, was because of that kind of suddenness of suddenly um, you are an outsider, you're an enemy. And I tried to convey how confused Will is by this. It's like he, he can't believe this is happening. Yeah. It's an alternate universe. Yeah. And, and you capture that, his confusion, and, and the bizarre churning in people's heads. One of the things I thought was very interesting, by the way, is that you have a few black people. And, of course, there were blacks already, you know, even though we think of the North as being without slaves, there were some, mm -hmm. and there were blacks. And one of the things is that you get across very interestingly from a modern point of view 
<clears throat> is that the blacks don't turn. And you come across very strongly, hey, we feel like we're outsiders too, and we know that's not right. The, the thing is that in the Shaker community, one of the things they were so progressive about is they uh, included everybody, including blacks, and you as a black person could become an elder. You could become one of the sisters, an elderess, and uh, they educated everybody the same. And, uh, I, you know, I think that was extremely unusual. That was another reason that they were suspect, of course. And after the 1793 uh, Fugitive Slave Act, a lot of uh, blacks who had been slaves, of course, escaped to the North. Right. So it was not uncommon to have slave takers go back and try to take them. Um, and, of course, in some of the prior books, Will Reese has helped some of these black people, and they did not forget. They didn't forget, even though some of his friends turned on him, his white friends. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to Walking on Weanside. I'm here with Eleanor Coons, uh, and we've been discussing her five books set in the period of just after the Revolutionary War in Maine and New England, and the last of which is called The Devil's Cold Dish. And before we get to my next topic on this wonderful book, Eleanor, I was wondering if you could tell people how they could find out more about you. Do you have a, a web page? I do. I have a web page. It's www.eleanor-coons.com. -E okay. uh, you can find me on Facebook under my name. Uh, also, um, I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn. So... If you put in my name, usually I'm the one that comes up. Not too many Eleanor Coonses out there. <laughs> I can't have means. <laughs> so, folks, when you're looking for her name, you can look for mine. 
<laughs> but, but don't look for John Smith. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now, one of the things, of course, having spent a lot of my life in, in Maine, one of the things I know about Maine and farming is there's really only one dependable crop you can raise in Maine almost everywhere in the state, and that's rocks, big boulders. Right. So let's talk a little about the, the topography, the setting, the physical existence of the story, because you use it very nicely. You create a place for us. So tell us a little about the place you've created, Eleanor. Well, I will, I will start out first to say that it is an amalgam of many of the places I've been in Maine. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been, I, I mentioned before, my mother uh, was a Mainer and she lived in Maine. And we had, we st I still have family in Maine. And we lived there for a while and we spent a lot of time driving around Maine. And when I came to write these books, I would choose a river for one place, a lot of the mountain or uh, hilly uh, topography, those things are from Acadia, mm -hmm. uh, wonderful hiking, and it's like the bedrock is right up through, yep. right there. There's no, no covering. And so I, talked, I talk a lot about how difficult it is to farm in Maine, and of course during this time most people were farmers. Maine is rocky. It does not have a long-growing climate. In fact, if you talk to a Mainer, they talk about uh, summer, winter, and mud season as being the three seasons. Uh, so I try to convey not just his life, but how difficult it was to survive in that kind of uh, climate without really fertile land and rolling hills and all of that. It's an, it's an effort. And I think my opinion is that it kind of informs Will's character. He's strong and he's stubborn. And I think you have to be that kind of person to survive. It also informs the character of somebody else that I really care a lot about in the book and I want to get to. But before I do that, just a quick aside, folks. If you ever do talk to somebody from Maine, Yes, we are Mainers. You do not call us maniacs. Yes, <laughs> them fighting words. Them fighting words. Okay, but now you mentioned this other character a little bit earlier, and that's Will's son. And his character is certainly in large part formed by his connection to the land and the farm because... <clears throat> His dad has been away first, I, I, you know, I mean, he, he's a traveling guy. First he's in the service, then he comes back, he, and then he, he's off weaving, and then his, uh, David's mother dies. So he, here's this young man growing up, and his real, his constant is the farm. And right. he loves the farm. And he loves the animals on the farm, particularly. <clears throat> yeah. Cows, the horse. Yes, yeah. that's his. That's his. His. Uh, his strength. Mm -hmm. And I tried to put that in partly because I wanted to show that both Will and his son David are not right or wrong. They're different, and they, but they don't really understand how the other one feels about the farm and the land and f the future that that they might have. But, of course, in the end, one of the nice things, because this is the last of a series of some stories. Well, there may be maybe, others Maybe coming. more to come, but I mean... Yeah, but, but, yes, but this, this is the last so far. Yeah, and, and there is a rapprochement between father yes. and son. And I think it's a very beautiful one. Do you want to talk a little about, without spoiling plot, do you want to talk a little bit about that rapprochement? Well, of course, in the first book, David is only eight. Right. And Will, at, at this point, is willing, no pun intended, to come, come back and reconnect with his son. And it takes him a long time to do that. And, of course, David is growing up at the same time. So, in a way, both of them are growing up together. Yeah. Uh, they both have to come to tolerance, which you mentioned before, of other both the other's point of view. Yeah. 
And I think I try to um, convey that they've always loved one another. They just haven't really understood one another. And finally, they get to a point where they're, they're able to see that they love each other enough to overlook the differences between them. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, yeah, we don't want to go too much further into it because of the, the you know, we don't want to take away from your pleasure in reading The Devil's Cold Dish. But <clears throat> what I do want to mention here is, is that the, the multi-layered, multi-dimensioned quality of this book. You see, when we're talking about history, we're talking about uh, how people lived during that time, we're talking about religion and tolerance, we're talking about murder and mystery, we're talking about family life and, and father and son relationship. This is, this is, it may be the devil's cold dish, but it's a well-textured, well-layered dish, well worth your eating, if I'm keeping <laughs> metaphor going. Um, <clears throat> now, not all the families that you portray in this book are equally happy or equally tolerant or equally aware. Um, and so you, you get a sense of, and that's another thing I like about this book, that even though it's in a small town, I mean, really pretty small town. Mm -hmm. We really have diversity, black and white. Uh, one of the one of Will's few true friends, he, his mother is a, basically a laundress. And, right. and she's quite a character herself, isn't she? Yeah, she is. Um, but uh, Caldwell, I think you, ha I mean, he, he, it's his mother. You have to kind of explain the dynamic between them, don't you? Oh, yeah. And I thought he was kind of an interesting character, and I started him a few books back, so I wanted to explain where he came from. Yeah, one of the things that's fascinating about him is that he may be the best exemplary of, of uh, was it uh, Peanuts cartoon where he had pig pen? And the dirt yes, kind of yes, following absolutely. him around. And that's, this this guy is a pig pen. Yes, and he is. His, and his, this is in uh, reaction formation to his mother, who is not just a laundress, but a clean freak. Yes. And, and I thought, my God, I mean, these are not, she's not a major character in this book. And that's why I'm, why I'm doing this. I'm mentioning her. She's, she's a relatively minor character. A couple chapters she's in, and you know, I won't explain why, but Will ends up at her home along with her son. And yet, in this couple of chapters, this little bit of introduction to her, you see, you add this wonderful texture. It's like adding an aromatic herb to to a stew. All of a sudden, ah, there's something new here. Well, I, when I, I do them, even some of the characters that don't have names, they all have backstories. Because one of my philosophies is everybody has a story. And it, you, know, you may choose to write the, the story from one person's point of view, but it doesn't mean that everybody else hasn't had their own perspective on that story, their own history, their own life, and how they feel at this particular point in time. So, even the ones who don't have names, in my mind, they are real people with a history in that town. And of course, she, she's one of them. She's, she has a past. She knows Will's mother, or knew Will's mother before she passed away. So, she too has, has a story. So now the let's talk just very briefly because we're almost out of time about the title of this book, "The Devil's Cold Dish." Now, of course, this cold dish is, of course, refers to what? Well, it refers to revenge and to malice, yeah. and I added the devil because uh, when I was thinking of the title, what I really wanted to talk about was. You know that old saying, I'm sure you've heard it in Maine, 
If you sup with the devil, you should have a long spoon. And that revenge and malice are some of those things that perhaps you're take, partaking with the devil. And, of course, it tied in with the, the witchcraft that Lydia is accused of. So what I really was really talking about was the malice and the resentment that informs some of these and drives some people to do things that uh, include murder and other things that are really Pretty terrible, perfect. terrible things. Yeah. 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 One more thing, by the way, folks. It's I love the way Elena Coons has worked food into this story. You know, it isn't just kind of okay. Now the next action. Now this this food brings us together. Yes. And I think that the fact that you've used a title that references food in the Devil's Cold Dish. To, to get across not only the idea that revenge is a dish be best served cold, mm -hmm. but also that when we sit down and share a meal together, okay, that defines our connection in many ways. And in this book, I think one of the things I like so much is that there's so much connection of people. People People, people. So land, yes, farming, yes, history, yes, but I love your characters even more. So uh, Eleanor Coons, thank you so much for walking on the ween side, and thank you even more for writing The Devil's Cold Dish. Folks, look for it. You're going to enjoy reading it. Well, thank you very, very much for having me. It was a wonderful interview. Be well. You stopped instead, I caught your smile. I'm just no good, no good. It's too late to dream of all we My coffee queen. Do you guys a little John party? So if you like it, please give it a like, share, subscribe.